the top of the line Volkswagen Atlas offers over 276 horsepower. All wheel drive and tows over 2,200 kilograms. Yet, it might very well be too late. The Atlas is a product that Volkswagen needed to build five years ago, and maybe even 10 years ago. Sometimes it's smarter to be a smart follower than to be too early. The segment is strong, big, developed, and we bring a great package which will find its customers. While it's a dramatic portfolio shift, it's not the first time that Volkswagen has tried to play the SUV game. VW SUV might sound a little weird just because they haven't been very good at it. It's taken Volkswagen a long time to really embrace the SUV market. In 2007, the brand introduces a compact SUV called the Tiguan. The Tiguan, which is their small SUV, is good, but it might have been a little too small for the US market, a little too expensive. This was not Volkswagen saying, let's create an SUV. It was, let's make an SUV out of this existing hatchback. And it was priced out of the market by all of the Japanese and American competition that just made a better product at a lower price. The brand's first foray comes five years prior, when it introduces the full-size Touareg. The Touareg just had one of the strangest names ever applied to an SUV. The Touareg, the bigger one, was also almost a luxury vehicle. Volkswagen has a really funny love-hate relationship with names. Its original cars weren't named at all. The Beetle was not named by Volkswagen. That was a nickname given to it by people. Same thing with the bus. Volkswagen's next generation had some of the best names ever because they were all named after winds and no one noticed it. Golf for Golf Stream, Jetta for Jetstream, Passat, Scirocco, all these other great names. Then they started naming their cars after combinations of words that make no sense, like Tiguan and Tuareg and all this obscure stuff, which means nothing to anyone. It's kind of amazing that nobody had taken the Atlas name already. I think it's a fantastic name. I mean, it connotes strength, it connotes size, but nobody had taken that name somehow. So the Atlas is their new three euro SUV. The market moved more towards everyday SUVs. And for a long time, Volkswagen stuck with its strategy. Small one, big one, done. But that's not where the market is now. Highlighting VW's troubles, the Tiguan and the Touareg collectively sell 400,000 machines per year in the United States. Meanwhile, Honda sells nearly as many machines with just their CRV platform. One of the defining characteristics of Volkswagen is that they can't be successful in the US. This is the thorn in the side of all Volkswagen executives for the last 30 years. Volkswagen has wanted to become more than just a small player in the United States. In the rest of the world, it's huge. It's just a gigantic, gigantic brand that sells a lot of cars. So about a decade ago, they decided the way to fix that is to bifurcate their product line. They have the, the products that sell everywhere in the rest of the world and the stuff that will be specifically for the US. Americans, generally speaking, like to have uh, more family-friendly, larger cars. That's why it was so important that we arrived with the Atlas in, into this segment. It's a mid-size SUV, and if you look at the development of the automotive market, especially in the US, in the past years, you can see that the SUV segment is a, a very, very fast-growing segment. The importance of those customers can't be overstated. These days, 40% of the automotive industry's sales come from utility vehicles. Volkswagen, let's remember, means people's car. And if it's one thing that Volkswagen has pulled off through the years over and over again, it's making a car that punches way over its weight for people. The Atlas looks at what people really need and gives it to them at a price that's half of what it really should be. Building that value begins inside the Gestamp press shop. Gestamp's normal business mode is we travel wherever the customer goes, and that's why we're here in Chattanooga. Gestamp is a Spanish multinational corporation that operates in 21 different countries. While you may not have heard their name, there's a good chance that they pressed the body panels on your car. We stamp everything from the roof to the hood, the hood inner, the door outers, the fenders, the lift gate, 
the body side, the entire outside shell of the vehicle. The 170,000 square foot shop features six gigantic presses that create 415 vehicles worth of parts every day. The lead press is 2,500 tons. It's approximately 450 Asian elephants. Most presses this size are mechanical, meaning that they create parts with force. But the Gestamp plant features hydraulic units, which form the parts using pressure. So our blanks come in, it's loaded onto a conveyor, goes through a wash, then it goes into the first operation, which is typically a draw. So about 90% of the part is formed. Then it goes through subsequent operations that'll either trim or pierce holes or put final form in. The blank body sides weigh 28 kilograms when they're loaded, yet lose half that weight once pressed. Metal stamping, automotive metal stamping is all I know. It's the only business I've ever been in is automotive tier one metal stamping business. After 18, 19 years, it's, if I wasn't passionate about it, it'd be pretty frustrating. <laughs> Every five minutes, a finished part rolls off the line. Then a team member rubs oil on it to check the quality. Well, that's called highlighting. So when you highlight the part, it gives it the appearance of a painted part. So you can find the defects in it, highs, lows, slivers, all kinds of defects are detected in the highlight book. You have to be able to read the lights. The way the lights break, tells you what kind of defects you have in. It's an old school skill that requires a lot of practice to get right. I've been doing it for about 25 years, so it, it takes time. It takes time to be able to see defects in the highlight of the book. Reviewing how the light moves over the panel identifies defects. But the real highlight is the factory campus itself. At the dawn of the new century, the city of Chattanooga decides their best hope for an economic explosion is to lure big business. This used to be a TNT manufacturing facility back in the 40s. Started in the 40s and made TNT. And it was sitting there, it shut down in the mid 90s. Tennessee and Chattanooga got together and developed it for a manufacturer to come in. The city revitalizes 24 square kilometers of a destitute former ammunition factory and turns it into a massive industrial park. This was all just kind of developed flat land, and now you see there's two supplier park buildings, there's Volkswagen itself, there's two Gestapo facilities, Amazon's come here locally. All that developed land has all changed overnight in the last eight years since I've been coming down here. VW's arrival immediately adds 10,000 new jobs to the area. The automotive industry has brought a lot of jobs. It's really nice to see you know, the economic growth in Chattanooga in particular. The other economic things, all the supporting businesses and small production supply companies that are now larger. Building the factory is relatively easy. But in an area with very little automotive know-how, finding skilled tradespeople is the challenge. Capital investment has had a renaissance, but the skill set has not had a renaissance. So it's clear that our biggest struggle in all of Chattanooga is the ability to hire toolmakers. We struggle with that every day. To ensure their future, the brand partners with the state of Tennessee and creates a unique apprenticeship program called the Volkswagen Academy. We have a three-year program, and we train them, but they're also students of Chattanooga State. The benefit is, at the end, they get an associate's degree in applied science. They get certified by the German-American Chamber of Commerce, and then they also get a conditional job offer through Volkswagen. It's a win-win that's of increasing importance thanks to what's become known as the trade skills gap. I think society pushed to higher-paying jobs where you weren't successful unless you were a boss. 
and or you are an engineer designing and creating it. Everybody is going for four-year degrees, and that's great, but industry needs people that has hands-on skills. You shift the generation towards engineering and computers, you then lack kids that are interested in turning a wrench. We've got more than 800 robots down in the plant, and we need somebody that can program them, somebody that can maintain them and take care of them. The need for skilled tradespeople isn't just an issue facing Volkswagen, but rather a growing worldwide epidemic. We work a lot with the government. They've estimated that there's more than 160,000 jobs across the United States that go unfilled because they don't have the hands-on skills that we're teaching here in this program. The brand has a tremendous incentive to help fill the void. Every minute that the factory goes down costs the company up to $10,000. We're teaching primarily Megatronics here. Megatronics sounds like a sci-fi term, but it's actually a multidisciplinary field of study that combines mechanical engineering, electronics, and computer science. A lot of companies will teach somebody to be a mechanic or an electrician or an IT person. And the problem is, say a motor goes bad in a robot, and then you have to have a mechanic change the motor, an electrician has to wire it, and an IT person has to program it. Our people can do all three. Being able to service a robot is important. If you take a basic robot, for example, it's got three major functions. It has to have the mechanics to be able to move, and that's a lot of times done with pneumatics and hydraulics. It also has to have the brains behind it, which is the PLC, the Programmable Logic Controllers. Then it has to have the communication that's going to take it from the brain to that motor to make the robot move. All these are things that we teach here. Training the next generation doesn't start with books, but rather blocks. So we'll take this block, they will physically take a hacksaw and cut it down to size, file this down till they make this perfect block. And so they start you off with filing, and then they advance you into a lathe and a knee mill, and then they'll put you into electrical classes and get the theory of it, and then once you get the theory and understand the theory, they start applying the electrical side of it with your motors, your drives, and your PLC, what we're doing today. This right here, I believe, is the backbone of America. I mean, how many things would not have been made if it wasn't for machines like these? So I think it's amazing to be able to know how to run one of these. If you spent eight weeks with a file creating that, then you really respect what machinery can do, and it really gives you the idea of how precise we need to be. It's a quest for precision that often leads to a new way of life. For the last 11 years, I've been in heating and air conditioning. I decided that either you can go down into a plant and be on the line and one day be replaced by a robot, where if you work on them, you don't get replaced. <laughs> These days, there's no more important place to keep robots running than in the body shop where a ballet of machinery creates one of the safest SUVs in the world. <laughs>